<laughs> All right, let me try that one more time. Uh, welcome everyone. This is Una Daly from the Community College Consortium for OER. We're part of the Open Education Global organization and uh, who are the organizers. We are the organizers of Open Education Week. And we are so excited to see 2020 is just an amazing year for Open Education Week. Um, there have been um, somewhere on the nearly 100 webinars offered um, or online events offered this week on open education. And this is the eighth year that it's been celebrated. And I think there's been a really huge upswing since 2019. It's been growing all along, but um, it's really exciting to see that. And um, we have um, a great set of speakers for you here this morning. And um, we're going to go ahead and get started. All right, here's our agenda. You're going to get to meet um, the leaders of the regional leaders of open education. And um, we're going to um, hear from each group. And then each group is going to invite feedback from you. Um, but first off, I wanted just to give you a little bit of background about the regional leader for re leaders of open education. Um, it was launched last fall. Um, actually, we had a pre-conference day workshop at the Open Education Conference 2019. And this project um, has been in response to our members' needs. Um, our members, our CCC OER members, um, have grown from OER leaders at their individual colleges and institutions into statewide OER leaders. And they now have a need and a desire to share and collaborate with other state leaders on OER practices, policies, organizational models, professional development, and other issues. And that led to our planning and implementation of the, um, the get together at Open Ed um, this last fall. We extended invitations to OER leaders at four year and two year public institutions and other organizations um, engaged in OER, primarily foundations and that variety across the country and we had representatives, we had about 55 folks participating uh, from 27 states. And the work groups grew a little bit after that. Um, but they were organized around four specific areas. One was statewide policy and strategy and the issues of implementation. Uh, this, the next one is stewardship, so stewardship of OER content and also of data, particularly student data as it's being gathered, um, and how we, how, what's the ethical way to deal with that. Um, the third area was professionalism of the open education field. So much like online education 15 or 20 years ago was a very uh, kind of wild west profession, um, it has now developed into a full set of competencies and skills at both the faculty level, uh, administration level, institutional level. And so we see that happening with open education as well. Um, and finally, um, sustainability of open education. What are the models to bring that forward and make sure that um, open education is sustained over time? So we've also had the good fortune to have another statewide OER leadership group that is um, that it was launched um, a, a, a little bit before us and is working on some similar projects. Um, that are very complementary, and that is the Doers Network. And they were originally started out of, um, let me see if I get this right, originally out of the SUNY, the State University of New York, and the CUNY, the City University of New York, and the University of Maryland Kerwin Center. Um, and it has now become a national uh, group as well. And they are working on um, similar statewide policy, but from a senior administrator perspective. And we've been collaborating with them and they're, um, and um, hearing what they're working on and um, trying to leverage different areas that uh, we can work on together. So um, lots of great work happening in this area and um, glad that you could join us this morning to hear about what we're doing with the regional leaders. And now I wanna just give a chance to all of our speakers to introduce themselves before we head into the uh, 
into the presentations. And I'm, I'm going to start, I'm just going to go round robin here, and I'm going to start with Lisa Young, who is the faculty direct, director for the Center of Teaching and Learning at Scottsdale Community College. Hi, everybody. Just wanted to say good afternoon to you all. Happy Hope and Ed Week. I'm excited to share the work that we've been doing in regard to policy and strategy. Thank you, Lisa. And next up is Denise Cote, professor and librarian at College of DuPage. Hi, everybody. I'm Denise Cote. I'm happy to be here today. Happy Open Ed Week. Thank you, Denise. Um, Quill West, Open Education Project Manager at Pierce College in Washington State. Hi, everybody. I'm Quill, um, and happy Open Education Week. All right. And next up is James Glapacros. Grossclag, sorry, James, Dean of Educational Technology, Learning Resources, and Distance Learning at College of the Canyons in California. Hey, everybody, James here. Really glad to uh, be part of this. And uh, in, you know, in my mind, I think this is really exciting to see uh, sort of the loose movement uh, evolving towards more of a professional field. So I'm really excited to be part of this. Thank you, James. And next is Amy Hofer, who is the coordinator of the Open Oregon Educational Resources Project. Hi, this is Amy. Um, I facilitated the sustainability work group, and I'm looking forward to telling folks more about what we've been working on. Thank you, Amy. And last but not least, we have Kevin Cochran, who is the executive director of digital learning at Connecticut State Colleges and University. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. I'm working with Amy on the sustainability front, so I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing what we've been doing. And I might add that um, Kevin is also a member of the Doers um, group as well. Yes, and, and you got the three groups down pat. Good job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All righty. All right, I'm going to turn this over now to uh, Denise and Lisa to talk about policy and strategy implementation. Okay, thanks Una. Hi, Denise here. I'm not gonna turn on my camera because I'm at home and this picture is much better than what I look like right now. <laughs> um, so I wanted to thank um, the CCC OER for putting together this amazing group. Um, I feel kind of awed by the people that I get to work with on this project. I'm, I'm pretty much the newbie among them, so I'm super excited to be a part of this and I'm learning so much. So we're working on two projects. Um, the first is a video series on key topics in OER policy, and the absolutely amazing Lisa Young is heading up that project. So um, I think, Lisa, you wanted to, to go first, um, and then I'll talk about the other things that we're working on. These are the people that are in our group. Look at this amazing group of people from all over the country, and we have um, Richard and Ryan who are from large foundations that are interested in um, policy and strategy. So it's great to be among all of these people. And so when we got together um, back in October before Open Ed, we, um, that group came together and we brainstormed a lot of different ideas of what we might like to do in regard to um, policy and strategy for state and regional um, OER organizations and groups. And so one of the things that we came up with was the idea of a video audio series, really looking at a number of key topics um, in state and regional OER policy. So our first thing that we're working on, and we um, are hoping to get one done early next week, we're hoping, but the idea to put together, have different state and regional OER leaders uh, put together a video or an audio um, that we can share with everyone that explains what, how their state or regional partnership, what it is, how it came about, um, what they feel is the most effective lever for increasing OER adoption in their state and region, and what their lessons learned have been. And the idea is to keep this really short and sweet, um, about three minutes, and we're using two different tools to create these videos and audio files. Um, the audio series will be using a tool called StoryCorps, and the videos will be done using a tool called Flipgrid, and then they'll be hosted um, within the CCC OER area, and they'll be on demand. So anytime someone has, you know, 
the desire to learn a little bit more about what one of our state or regional OER policies is working on, they'll have an opportunity to go into that and it'll be something that's living, breathing. We'll start with these topics and then perhaps move on to some other topics. And so that's one project within our policy and strategy group. All right, thank you, Lisa. Um, Lisa, are you looking for people in, in states, in some of the states? Do you still looking for folks or? Absolutely, if anyone's interested in um, participating and putting one of these um, audio story core or flip grids together with us, I would love to chat with you. So please send me an email at lisa.young at scottsdalecc.edu and I'll put that in the chat. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa, I'm so excited. Um, so we are also planning a best practices guide for state and regional OER leaders who are working on implementing state policy. So it's great when state policies are made, but um, when it's great when state policies are made, but the people that are responsible for enacting those policies often have to figure out how to begin or how to maintain those programs. So a collection of policies for implementation that illustrate best practices would be really useful to OER leaders that are working at the state and regional level. So we started by crosswalking the sections of the SPARC state policy playbook. And we did check with SPARC to make sure that they aren't already keeping a, data a database of um, policy language. They track bills and examples of good implementation, but they're not ma maintaining a database, just the good examples. Um, can we have the slide? So for instance, under the topic of OER grant funding, the programs in Massachusetts and North Dakota are provided as examples of how to facilitate state funding for OER grants. So we'll reach out to leaders in Massachusetts and North, North Dakota to get the actual language that they use to lay out those programs. We have the slide. So we're also looking at topics like course marking, statewide committees, state funded surveys, research studies, mandated institutional policies and stuff like that. And we know that there's a book coming out soon on course marking that'll be really helpful to state and regional leaders. I'm excited to see that. Um, mandated reporting seems to be the most difficult area for people on our team. So this gets down to the institutional level though and we wanna try and keep it at the state and region levels. So we'll look at how those reports come up from the institutions to the state and regional leaders and then to report that information to the state. Next slide. So these are some general resources that we've been looking at. Um, there was a call just this past week to contribute to the, o, the OER policy world map project. I don't know if we can click on that link, but it kind of that's fine if you can, sorry. Um, our group hasn't discussed this yet, but we could participate in this policy. Um, they're calling it an add-a-thon, I kind of like that, and be able to use that repository as a central location for policies, and then we'd be able to extract, extract best practices from that collection. And since we're trying to hone in on like common language, perhaps we can make this resource more current and useful and address our goal of identifying best practices at the same time. So I'm going to ask Una to help me get a meeting with the policy world map administrators and ask them what they think of the idea. So on um, the slide. And I'm also inviting you, um, the people here today, to give me feedback on that idea and um, on the best practices project in general. And my email address is on the next slide. So that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Denise. Um, do we have any questions for Denise or Lisa? Oh, I don't think I can see the chat, hold on. I'll let you know if there are any, at the moment I don't um, see any questions from anyone. Okay, thank uh, you. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for sharing that, um, Denise and Lisa. Um, it's a very exciting area and something that, um, we want to share with the whole um, open education community uh, when those are available. All right, next I'm going to move to um, Quill West um, on the professionalism of the open educator. 
Hello, everybody. Um, okay, so I'm hoping that you can see everything and I'm not sitting in shadow. I, my desk face, it, it has the sun behind me. Um, okay, so- you're in, you're in shadow, I just have to tell you. But, all right, in but, that case, so I look a little less sinister, sinister I'll turn off my video so you oh. can just see the slides because <laughs> I can't move from where I am without disrupting oh, I, I think it was fine, but it was shadowy. That's no issue. Okay. Um, it, it's proof that the sun sometimes shines in Seattle. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right. So let's go ahead and click to the next slide so I can explain what we're here to do. So first I want to um, point out our amazing team that includes um, several folks who are really interested in answering the question what does it mean to be to practice as a professional in the open education space? Um, and so our team has come together in several meetings to try to decide how we define that. Um, and in our initial meetings, we talked about the ethics of open education and what ethics stand for in our field beyond openness, which is in itself a type of ethic, but what other things do we stand for as a profession? Um, and what we decided on is actually we can't get at that until we can actually define kind of what are what what are the different roles people play in our profession because um, people are coming at this um, this work from a variety of different places. So um, you know if you'll advance for me. And so these are some questions that we're wrestling with right now. Uh, what are our professional practices? What does it mean to, to be an open education educator? Um, and how are people supposed to find out about it once we decide what our competencies are in different spaces? Uh, how, if I'm new to open education or if I want to be interested in open education and I'm in school right now, how do I find out how to do that? Um, if if I'm a faculty member or somebody who's practicing in graduate school right now, how do I find out about open education? How do I come to this profession and how do I um, get hired in it? And then if I'm an employer, which um, my institution is often in the place in, of, how do I identify people who will be successful in promoting open education at my institution um, if I don't know what those competencies look like. So we kind of came down to, to answer all of these questions, we need to define the roles that people are currently working on in, in this, um, in open education, and then decide what skill sets they've got. Um, so, you know, if you'll move me forward a little bit. Um, so we, this is kind of our methodology, I won't read this whole slide to you, but um, our, product is going to be a matrix which kind of, and, and we're calling it a matrix we're trying to build some relationship between um the different roles so for example um there's a lot of big evidence in the library field about what it means to be an open education librarian what are the skills they need to have they've having some great conversations about that Thanks, Amanda Larson, who is here today, who's have been engaged in a lot of those conversations. We're using her work. Um, but that has happened in the library field. It has not happened in the instructional design field, for example. But some of those competencies overlap. So how can we define when and how they overlap and figure out professional developments that address both of those fields? So. Um, that's where we get at, as a person with training in librarianship, that's where we get at a set of um, controlled vocabulary and crosswalk skill sets. Um, so, and then we can look at professional development options that are out there and map those to specific roles and skill sets. Um, so this is, um, this is something that we've been working on pretty extensively, trying to define those roles. Uh, so let me give you an example of what I'm talking about on our next slide. So, um, oh, these are some of the places that we've started to identify roles and, um, and this is kind of some of the work we're basing off and Amanda's work isn't listed here, but it should be. Um, so 
um, collections of job descriptions, Salt Lake Community College built a beautiful one that we have been very lucky to be able to use. Um, so, and then there was an attempt done um, at the international level, um, the competency framework that a lot of folks have used. Maricopa is a great example of a place that's using that right now um, to try to define competencies in open education for their district. Um, and then we're using our own experience and now we're hoping to use your experience <laughs> to try to understand what are the different roles people play and what are the skill sets they've got. Uh, so now I'll give you an example. We'll go to the next one. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so one thing from um, that competency set I just mentioned is the big skill set of revise OER. And they're mostly talking about how faculty revise OER. But it maps to, so all of the different positions that we've identified that have to know about how to revise OER are discipline faculty, publishing librarians, instructional designers, um, teachers in the K-12 space, technologists, um, trainers, and then others because some positions are really interesting. There's some of us who have really interesting hybrid positions that are mostly administrative, but then get into some of the um, into some of the actual revision or creation of OER as well. So um, we looked at that. We tried to identify, first of all, we're breaking down what revised OER means into smaller skill sets, but they map into all of those fields. Um, and then we went looking for professional development that fits that where you can learn that. And it just so happens that tutorial two in the Affordable Learning Georgia training is all about how to revise OER. So that would be one that we would suggest. You can go here and read about these skills and maybe develop them. And eventually we want to be able to map the professional development we can find to specific skill sets and then make recommendations to people. Um, the other thing that we want to be able to do with that then is identify when there's non-existent training for skill sets that we think are really important. So that'll be down the road. We are nowhere near a place where we can recommend trainings that need to be built yet, but we can definitely start to say, oh yeah, here are some trainings you should look at if you're interested in developing this skill set. Okay, Una, if you'll move forward for me. Okay, and let me know, Thanks. Quill, if you want me to take go out to any of your links. I just wanted to be able to put them in the, uh, because I know the slides will be available to people later if they want them. <laughs> um, so um, again, eventually our major goal statement is that people will be able to use the matrix to find professional development, help write job descriptions, because there's an awful lot of that back channel conversation happening. If we want to hire an instructional designer who knows about OER, how do we write a job description? Um, and, and then so that we as a, as a field can have better conversations about what it means to be a professional so that we can start to think about what will be our professional ethics? How should we invite people into our profession so that they can do this job? Um, how do we grow our space? So that's our, that's kind of my, our underlying message here um, and why we think that this is really important from a statewide leadership level, but just from a professional leadership level, from a field. Um, so to help us with that, and then we'll come to our, our next slide, <laughs> um, to, I'm asking for your help. And one of the ways that we'd like to ask people to get involved um, is we, I've put together a Google form where we're asking people who are willing to think about their role and title in this, um, in, in their work in open education, to tell us a little bit about um, what you do, um, what competencies you think are most important in the work you do, and then if you have a professional development that you think we'd like to see that's openly licensed and available on the web so that we can direct people to it and you'd like to nominate it to go into our matrix, please fill out the Google form that I'm linking to here and that is on the next slide because I talked ahead. 
Um, so as you can see, I popped it in the chat window, but there's also a link in our slides to the same thing. Um, so, and I wanna say thank you to my team one more time because there are so many professional development opportunities out there that it would be impossible for one person to track. So it's nice to be able to have statewide leaders across the um, United States being able to say to us, here's some options. Um, so now we're hoping that you'll help share with us some of the options that we didn't see just because we're not as familiar with your local institutions. Great. I'm really ha happy to take questions. <laughs> Absolutely. Questions, feedback for Quill? All right, well, we'll, you can continue to provide that as it comes up for you um, in our chat window. And um, as you can see, both uh, Denise, Lisa, and Quill are inviting your feedback and participation in whatever way might make sense. So we're welcoming the open community um, on all of this. And next up is James Glapa Grossclag, who is gonna talk about the OER Stewardship Group. Great, thank you, Una. It's just so exciting to, to hear all about all these projects and to, again, see the community coming together. And I, I just want to reiterate uh, Una's uh, encouragement for folks to provide feedback. And I, I'm, I'm confident I speak for all of the other uh, group leaders in saying that, you know, we are here as a collective, as a collective, we trying to move the field forward. So uh, we really uh, uh, will all value uh, any feedback, uh, cautions, suggestions, questions that y'all have. So, uh, with that, let's talk about OER stewardship. So, one of the one of the groups that uh, we uh, brought together uh, in that fabulous and fun uh, pre-conference uh, day at Open Ed uh, was devoted to the topic of stewardship. And go ahead, Una, in the next slide, we see the great folks that were uh, were included. Well, more folks were included in that day. Uh, some some folks have come and gone. Uh, this is the current collection of people who are working on the project or continuing to work on the project. As you can see, they are us. They are people like us uh, all over the, from all over the United States, different, different institutions, different systems. Uh, so uh, it's, it's really exciting to have so many different perspectives. And uh, let's go into the next slide and dive into the idea of stewardship. I think the group came together around this idea of stewardship being, being the ethics of care. And I've got a quote here or, uh, from, from the uh, or a definition from the Wikipedia entry on stewardship. Stewardship is an ethic that embodies the responsible planning and management of resources, generally recognized as the acceptance or assignment of responsibility to shepherd and safeguard the valuables of others. And I'll speak for myself uh, that the uh, my impetus in working with this group was comes comes from things that I'm I, I'm increasingly concerned about in the digital sphere uh, that generally are subsumed under the the label of uh, surveillance capitalism, uh, data security, cybersecurity, uh, uh, responsible digital citizenship. Uh, there, there I trust that we're all sort of familiar with these conversations bubbling up out there. Uh, what do we disclose to our students? Uh, what happens when we force our students into a, an automatic billing uh, program uh, uh, advanced by, by a commercial publisher? What happens when uh, someone hacks into our computers? And, and so on and so forth. All of these conversations that are bubbling up out there uh, make me uh, think about uh, my or our responsibility when we're working uh, on behalf of students, when we're working with one another, and when we're working with content that we're releasing into the open, what are the, uh, the ethics that are associated with that? How, do, how are we responsible uh, in this realm uh, in a day and age when we feel, I think, when we feel as though some, some really large issues are, are, are developing out there, but we're, at least speaking for myself, I'm not quite sure how to respond, not quite sure how to handle them. So that was a, a large part of the conversation uh, that, that we engaged in. And we emerged with two specific 
follow-ups, two, two tasks that we wanted to dig into further. And yeah, so to go to the next slide, please. Uh, first of all, we wanted to, we would like, or we are expanding and adapting the existing care framework. And I hope you're all familiar with the care framework that was published in 2018, put together by Doug Levin, Lisa Petridis, and Eddie Watson. And the CARE framework is a statement of principles about what effective stewardship and effective participation in open education uh, can look like. And it's organized around four principles. One is contribute, uh, that good stewards actively contribute their efforts. Uh, the other is attribute, uh, that good OER stewards practice what they call conspicuous attribution. Uh, the third uh, idea or principle is release. Uh, namely that good stewards release OER and they ensure that OER can be used beyond, let's say, a specific course instance. It's not all locked away in your course. And finally, empowering. Good, good stewards uh, empower the participation of new and non-traditional voices in OER creation and adaptation. Um, and, and these are fabulous principles. I think the, I, I would hope that many of us have been inspired by the care framework and we find it useful uh, and and we also find that with the emergence of awareness around uh, again surveillance capitalism the use of our data the use of our students data uh, we would like to uh, add layers to the care framework that can make make it more actionable for the field and more relevant and current for the emerging concerns today without any disrespect towards the original care framework but uh, we would like to uh, craft a statement uh, of principles or deepen the statement of principles again that, that make it a little bit more actionable today what do we do for example if we're releasing uh, content uh, under a cc by license and we know that a commercial publisher uses that in order to entice students to move into their uh, move into their surveillance regime through an automatic billing uh, practice what responsibility do we have then uh, should we have used a CC by license should we've chosen a different kind of license so those are the kinds of conversations in that group the second uh, resource that we would like to uh, build upon or that we're being inspired by is more student facing and that is a student bill of rights, uh, which we've uh, found uh, produced by an or a nonprofit organization called the Student Voice. And the Student Bill of Rights is, is a very brief document uh, stating general principles, uh, general rights for students around ideas such as access and affordability, due process, civic participation, uh, a voice in decision making in, in schools, pretty much pretty focused on the K-12 experience. Uh, however, we, we would like to build on this uh, as a statement of student rights for interacting with OER or interacting with open content and maybe the open community generally, open pedagogy as well, uh, in, in particular with regards to privacy and surveillance. So uh, again, those are larger, I think, concerns that are, are bubbling up out there. Uh, so we anticipate that our work output uh, for both of these uh, focal points will be written statements uh, that we would like to release to the, we'll, we'll release in draft form to the field and solicit feedback from the field. Um, and looking down the road, perhaps we will uh, pop up at conferences, for example, the Open Ed 20 conference with a listening session or discussion session so that we can continue to uh, iterate these documents uh, so that they're actionable in the field. Uh, and with that, Una, let's uh, move on. And I invite uh, uh, feedback uh, from all of you. You can pop me an email and I'll, I'll share your comments with the uh, particular groups that are working on those subtopics. And again, I think it's terribly exciting that we're even having these conversations. Again, uh, really underscoring the evolution of, uh, of open education as a, as a, as a maturing field. I'm really excited that we're all here. And back to you, Una. All right. Thank you very much, James. And um, now we're on to um, our final group on OER sustainability with Amy and uh, Kevin. Okay. Thanks, Una. 
Um, so um, the sustainability work group, um, when we met in person um, at the open ed pre-conference in Glendale, we talked about a lot of possible directions that we could go with this um, overall topic of sustainability. Um, generally speaking, we um, made an effort to really stay focused on um, the definition of sustainability um, from David Wiley, which is um, an OER initiative's ongoing ability to meet its goals. So we really wanted to sort of stay within that realm. And if you go on to the next slide, Una, I want to uh, recognize and give a really big thank you to the group members um, who are listed here. You can see we, um, we have an all-star group. Um, and so moving on, um, Nicole Allen started off our pre-conference day with um, some words that really inspired our group. She talked about um, OER as becoming um, core to what we do in higher ed, the way that roads and bridges are the kind of infrastructure that's, you know, um, core to the way that we <laughs> get around. Um, and so the kinds of transitions that we would like to see um, in order to have OER become part of our infrastructure in higher ed is, you know, things like moving from one time to continuous funding or having one campus um, be really active to having a whole system or state or region be active um, as, as a bigger cohort. Um, you know, moving from a model that is um, really relying on early adopters and individual champions to something where OER is more part of the campus culture. Um, and shifting from a mindset where OER is something extra, something additional that we add on to what we already do with our very full plates, moving more towards um, a culture where we think of OER as being already what we do. This is already part of our job. Um, and in order to get from point A to point B, you know, addressing the needs or the gaps, um, we will need expertise on campus, we'll need really skilled personnel, we're going to need OER teams and not just individuals to manage our efforts, and we're going to need both faculty and administrative support, so top down and bottom up. So, um, Una, if you'll go on to the next slide, please. Um, so um, we, because sustainability is such a big topic and there are so many really great conversations going on about what sustainability can look like, what it is, we decided to really focus in on one particular um, path to sustainability. Um, and, um, you know, this idea that if we're mainstreaming what we do, um, it'll, it'll become more sustainable. Um, and so an analogy that I want to give is um, that, you know, 15 years ago or so, online courses were viewed as only relevant to distance education, and it was kind of an extra or an add-on. But now it's so mainstreamed that um, at some institutions, um, you'll see that a course shell is automatically created for every single course that's offered. Um, regardless of the mode that the course is taught in, because we know that um, all students can benefit from having an online syllabus or an online gradebook, right? So um, we wanted to focus in on a project that would collect examples of where open ed is already embedded in existing processes in higher ed um, as models, as inspiration, um, to sort of remind ourselves that we may be further along than it might seem. So. Um, we, let's go on to the next slide and I'm going to hand it over to Kevin to talk a little bit about the SUNY Sustainability Toolkit. Thank you, Amy. So uh, as Amy alluded in the last slide, one of the projects uh, or one of the, the takeaways or deliverables that this, our sustainability group was to, to create a collection much like everyone else using a, a Google spreadsheet. But, we found that there was a tremendous resource already in existence that had some influence on how we structured the, the, the spreadsheet. So SUNY OER Services, who had partnered with the RPK group, had already put together a wonderful resource uh, that's available at the link, and we'll provide this in the slide deck, that really talked about sustainability, not in terms of financial, which many of us think about how are we going to fund this through whatever grant structures or where are we going to get the, the money to support this, 
But thinking about it, what Amy mentioned is how do you build this into the culture? How do you build this into the job descriptions as Quill mentioned? And so what they have done here is they've developed a field guide tool and a self-assessment tool that really talks about different ways that you can go about this conversation and do this self-assessment at your institution or within your system to see how, how have we uh, tackled or how have we discussed the infrastructure that supports around guidelines, processes, professional development, platforms, and people? How have we talked about the efficient use of resources or the funding of those resources? But most importantly, how have we talked about changing the culture so, so that open is ingrained in the vision statements, the metrics, the communications, so th this is a wonderful tool that helped influence the way we structured our collection guide. And with that, I'm gonna turn it right back to Amy. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so let's go on to the next slide, Una. Um, so as Kevin mentioned, we started putting together um, a, a collection of examples in a spreadsheet. And um, Una, if you'll click there, we'll give a little glimpse into the actual thing that we're working on. Um, and, and Una will be our driver. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you in advance for doing that. Sure. Um, so let's see. Um, did you did you click on the link? Um, are you not seeing it? Right, we're not seeing it yet. Um, and anybody else is welcome to follow along. It's tinyurl.com slash Arlo Sustainability. Um, and as I mentioned, um, what we're looking for here is um, not everything in the world. Oh, now we're seeing it. Thank you, Una. Um, so the scope here is not everything related to sustainability. What we're really looking for is existing examples of sustainability already being mainstreamed into higher ed processes and workflows. Um, so, um, you know, as Quill mentioned, um, when we're hiring people regardless of their role are we asking questions about open ed right so um, an example of a document that we would want to put into our filing cabinet would be um, the interview questions right that people are using um, so what we have here is our landing page um, that has some information about this resource um, it's got the short link it's got our licensing information and um, at the bottom of the document, you can see that our tabs are crosswalked with the sections in the SUNY Sustainability Toolkit because we really wanted to be building on the existing work that's already happening. Um, and Una, if you'll just click one of the tabs, we can show what we've got here. So um, the first row is the SUNY definition of um, the tab label, which in this case is professional development. And then we've got some examples that we've collected, um, the title, the creator, the license, the link. And then if you scroll over, um, we've got a really short description um, that just explains why does this belong here on this page and in this spreadsheet. Um, so thanks, Una, we can go back to the slideshow. Alrighty. You're our Vanna White, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Let's see, are you seeing the slides? Uh, no. <laughs> yes, yes. Zoom is acting up just a little bit today. Let me see. Oh, yeah. It always goes that way. Um, so I'll just go ahead and um, say that um, what we're looking for is more in scope examples that we can add to the tabs in the spreadsheet. Um, and the spreadsheet right now has editing permissions, so anybody can go in and add content. Um, you know, if there's a really good example of open ed being part of your PT guidelines at your institution or, you know, whatever it may be, um, we would love to have you add it to the spreadsheet. Um, and please do just take a minute on the About tab to make sure that you're aware of the scope of what we're looking for um, in order to keep the spreadsheet really, um, you know, focused on its purpose. Um, we're also curious about projects that might be in the pipeline that could be relevant when they're done. We would love to keep an eye on those. Um, our hope is that this will be a living document um, that can stay current and up to date as new um, information and resources become available. Um, and then last, if you want to get in touch, um, the Open Oregon contact page has a form that sends 
a message to my email and I'll also put my email address in the chat window. So that's what we've got. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy and Kevin. And um, before we uh, finalize, and, and we're and please do put questions um, for Kevin, Amy, and any 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 of our groups in the chat window, and we will get there just in a moment. Um, but I, I just wanted to do a little bit of a moving forward into the summer and fall. And before I do that. Um, I wanted to thank uh, the Hewlett Foundation who has been supporting this year-long exploration and has uh, really believed in the need for this, um, this um, regional leadership um, discussion and collaboration. And so we really do appreciate um, their support um, and recognition of the importance of this work. Um, and I, I wanted to just make one other point which may be obvious but <laughs> it just occurred to me as i was listening to all these amazing people i get to work with is what a great example of open practice each of the four projects is not starting at ground zero they are building on other openly licensed work uh, that has been done in their area and they're talking to those experts and making sure that they're leveraging that important work that's that was previously done and moving forward. And that really is about um, the, the practices of open education. So this is just a wonderful example. Um, and, you know, my hats are off to these amazing leaders who recognize that and, and, and operated it that way. So over the spring and summer, um, our groups are going to continue to develop these projects. Um, we're looking at methods of sharing the work group outputs um, more formally, but also in order to incorporate ongoing updates and feedback. So um, moving into the future, how do we continue to update these so these don't just become a snapshot, you know, 2020 policy and strategy. Um, so we're trying to, we're investigating that and that's actually something that we're looking at with the doers group as well. So how do we keep um, these efforts going and allow, um, other folks to update as well. Um, and in the fall, um, we will sometime, we haven't quite decided, but it'll be August or September, we'll have a webinar and we will give you more information and share more finalized um, forms of this project. Um, and there'll be invitations to, to the larger open education community to provide input. And hopefully we'll have a plan then for how we will do ongoing updates. And then Open Ed 2020, we're still keeping our fingers crossed, but that's moving ahead. It looks like it will be um, sometime in uh, November, is, is, um, I think is the latest I heard, don't, don't quote me on that. Uh, but we will once again have another get together. Uh, we're hoping it'll be a pre-conference day. And, um, and then we will submit also um, a panel proposal on this to the Open Ed Committee. And um, our work groups are individually looking at perhaps um, having um, discussion table groups on their areas or perhaps even doing a presentation themselves if they've got more information to share. So that is all we have um, of our plan presentation. And so we really welcome um, any input from you, questions, and you can grab a mic if you like. Um, perhaps um, some of my... Uh, or even some of um, our speakers from earlier um, who might uh, want to share something that's occurred to them since then. Uh, comments are fine as well. Is this something that um, you have a need for in your state as well? And if, you're, if your state's not participating, um, do you want to, do you have a need for that? So we welcome all comments and feedback. Yes, and thank you, Angela DeBarge from Hewlett, who joined us today to um, get an update on the Arlo groups. And we're pleased you could join us as well. Yeah, th this is James. I'll just comment. Uh, as excited as I am to work on the stewardship project, I am I am tremendously excited 
uh, to to see the output from the sustainability group. I think it's it's uh, an absolutely brilliant uh, approach to document what's already being done to mainstream or or uh, institutionalize, open, bring it in. Uh, that's an incredibly effective way to advocate for changes within within an organization. Uh, as, as as someone myself who works in an organization as a as an administrator, you know, sort of moving the levers and pushing the papers. Oftentimes, uh, one of the first questions that people ask is, "Where else has this been done? Is this is this already happening somewhere else?" So, having those examples will be incredibly powerful. Thanks, James. Um, you know, the reason that I <laughs> agreed to lead that work group was that the um, folks in our higher education coordinating commission were asking that exact question, like, how do other states make this sustainable? And um, I, I think that what, what the group has come to is a really hopeful message that we might actually be um, already doing this or closer than we think you know sustainability doesn't have to be something that's way out there in the future um it it might the seeds of it might already be planted um so yeah it's been a really nice group to work with mm -hmm. from that standpoint great um and i um it is wonderful that amy's group um does have materials that you can work with right away and something I might add, ask uh, our audience here is, how would you like to find out about um, updates and other, as these other projects become more mature over the summer, is there, is there a way that you'd like to stay connected? Um, so you can contact me or you can speak up now if you've got some ideas about how we could share those outputs with you when they're ready for more review. And um, there was a question here for uh, Quill. Um, Quill, you had, there was a question here from Amy about what was your timeline for uh, Purdue, for the matrix? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I was trying to establish that just the other day. Um, I think we're actually planning on um, working on the matrix through the spring, so we would probably be ready um, to deliver something a little more complete in the fall. So looking to that August or September webinar is about the time that we'd like to have something that we're ready for more people to see, but we might do limited releases in the middle. So if you're interested in that, participate in that Google form so that I know that you're ready um, and want to help us revise a draft. Great, thank you. Thank you for that, Quill. And if um, any of our audience out there has ideas about how we might share this, um, uh, please, please let us know. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Um, I, I agree. We will be doing a blog post on this webinar, so um, to share this a little bit more widely. Um, so just the overall project. Um, so yes, thanks. Thanks for that, Amy and, and Robin, um, for that, for asking that question. Um, and we don't currently have an ongoing blog on this particular topic. We do on a couple of other topics, Robin. Um, and um, but this may be another one. So thank you for that suggestion. All righty. Well, I'm going to turn off the recorder, but we will be here if you have uh, more questions or comments. And I want to thank um, our Arlo leaders and everyone else who was able to join us today and provide your feedback and, and just come and support